Welcome to the Bridgetown Daily for Friday, June 5th. John Mark Comer here. And as we near the end of our week, we continue to lament, and that is the best word I know for it, the recent string of racist shootings of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery and so many before them and the open wound of systemic racism in our nation and our city. And we are calling our church for the week ahead to a week of lament, to really set aside an entire week to process what we are feeling before God. And to set that up, my original plan for today was to interview my best friend, Dave Lomas. Dave, most of you know, is the pastor of Reality SF. He is a man of color himself and is the lead pastor of a very diverse and healthy and thriving church right in the middle of San Francisco. But he also does a daily podcast, and we kind of co-lead as best we can together and collaborate a lot. And uh, he just interviewed our mutual friend, Rich Velotis. Rich, if you don't know that name, is the pastor of New Life Fellowship in Queens, New York City. And if you don't know Rich, he took over for Pete Scazzaro of Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. And their church, that Rich is now the pastor of, is in one of, if not the most diverse zip codes in the country. And the way they balance emotional health, that's literally like the birthplace of emotionally healthy spirituality, and racial justice, they just do an incredible job of holding the two together. And Dave called me and said, hey, I don't think you should interview me. I think you need to listen to the audio of my phone call with Rich, and I think you just need to pay it, uh, to replay it. So I did that, and it's just beautiful. So with the full blessing of both Dave, it was his idea, and Rich, who's a friend of mine, here's a conversation between them on the intersection of emotional health and racial justice. It's a little bit different than what we normally do for a daily. There's not a contemplative prayer thing at the end, but I feel it feels right to me. Now is a time when white leaders like myself really need to, as best I can tell, this is at least my conviction, we need to listen to and learn from leaders of color. And so to listen in on my friend Dave and Rich, who's Puerto Rican, and how they are pastoring their churches and how there are many leagues ahead of us on so many levels. There's just a lot here for us to listen to and learn from. No matter where you come from, I think this is well worth your time. Peace to you as you head into Sabbath, as we process all of this before God and move into our weekend of worship on Sunday together. Here's my friends Rich and Dave. Hey, Rich. So um, really good to, to be with you. Thank you so much for saying yes to this. Um, so you lead uh, New Life Fellowship in New York City, uh, Queens specifically, and you know your uh, your church values. You guys have values that like kind of anchor your church in. Uh, two of them being the value of bridging cultural and racial barriers and the value of emotionally healthy spirituality. And those are the kind of our two themes this week as a church and things that we too value. And you guys have led in that. I guess my first question is, how do you do both during a time like this? Like that's kind of like that. What's your perspective as a, as a pastor in a church like that? Both of those things, holding both those things. Yeah, I mean, the larger perspective of our congregation and how we try to embody these values, not always successfully, I would say, um, because, you know, big church, lots of different people in different parts of their own journey, respectively. Um, I, I think what often happens in leadership and in congregations is there tends to be an emphasis. So we have the racial justice churches and then more of the, if you want to call it emotional health or folks who are focused more on interiority and such. Uh, and what we have found is uh, in order to be a whole person marked by Jesus and his kingdom, we are trying to marry really this interiority of life and holding on to the exterior mission that God has called us to. But emotional health at its core is about love. Yeah. And I think what, what often gets misunderstood about emotional health is we see it as simply a way for better self-regulation, a better, more self-awareness, uh, which are all wonderful things. 
Yeah. Uh, but if emotional health is framed in individualistic ways, is going to actually distance us from the kind of exterior mission God has entrusted us with. Wow. And so how we frame emotional health is about love. How do we love our neighbors well? How do we love ourselves well? And so uh, for us, we don't really see them really disconnected. We see them as the same coin, two sides of the same coin. Um, so it's, it, it, again, if, it's, if we're framing it in individualistic, private ways, I mean, we have a lot of self-aware, self-regulated um, people who don't know how to love their neighbor well. Wow. But the core of emotional health is love of neighbor. Dang, that's, that's so good. How, how do you connect with God like when your soul, like right now, real time, like a lot of ministers, pastors, leaders, and congregants, people in our church uh, are like exhausted. Like that's the kind of refrain that you hear from, uh, especially communities of color in our church, exhaustion. Um, how do you connect with God when your soul is exhausted from like another video or another explanation or another hard conversation? How do you connect with God in the middle of that? Are you asking me as a leader or just generally like what, um, both, both. like, how do you do it personally? And then how would you pastor people in doing that? Maybe you know, the same, same answer. What I have found personally true at the, at the start of this pandemic, it's often, I mean, we're in a pandemic, man. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> yeah, so at the start of the pandemic, I wanted to be meaningfully connected with our congregation. And that was kind of like my phrase for our congregation as yeah. we are socially and physically distanced, let's stay meaningfully connected in no, all kinds good. of ways. And I started a midday prayer. It'd be 15 minutes, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and I thought I'm gonna be a good pastor. I'm gonna teach people to pray and uh, and do the do the pastor thing. And what I have found in the simplicity of taking 15 minutes three days a week to pray the Psalms, to spend time in self examination, to be spend time in silence, and to spend time in intercession, and for 15 20 minutes. And I've been doing this now since mid March. So uh, we're talking now, you know, going on month three of doing this every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I have found, first of all, the gift of community and prayer and mm. what it does for my soul. Uh, and so, you know, good liturgy, um, you know, carries you when emotionally you can't walk yourself. That's what good liturgy does. And mm. I come from, you know, a Pentecostal charismatic evangelical tradition, which um, never really valued liturgy, but in my years of following Christ, I have personally valued liturgy. And I think that's the gift of that kind of intentionality of, hey, we're going to be silent now, and you might not be able to pray for yourself, but there's a community of people who are going to carry you in their prayers in real time. So I, I found, number one, that prayer with a community has been so incredibly important for me. Um, additionally, I mean, the practices that I was giving myself to prior to a pandemic, prior to any kind of racial public and explicit racial injustice. Um, I'm giving myself to those same practices. Yeah. And I think the danger, the inherent danger that people have whenever these moments come in our culture is they're going to use all of their energy for this particular moment not realizing that this is, to use Eugene Peterson's phrase, I mean, we're talking about a long obedience in the same direction. And so right. this is 400 years in the making. We're all exhausted. And if we think, um, I mean, you could vocalize your rage and denounce racism and do it all in five days and then go back to your life as usual. And then it's going to come back again. I think, I mean, I'm still keeping my Sabbath. So yeah. Friday night, 6 p.m. to Saturday night, 6 p.m. I'm still, I'm still stopping, resting, delighting, contemplating. I'm playing with my children, I'm going for walks with my family. I mean, the problems are going to wait for me. Uh, yeah. you know, so I have committed to prayer with people. I've committed to my Sabbath practices. Um, I've committed to talking to my wife about my feelings and how I'm doing. Yeah. Um, and so that's good emotional health, just expressing what's happening in my soul. Yeah, that's... That, that was one of the things I wanted to ask you specifically is your Sabbath r rhythms. Um, how, 
more, so what, let's click into the Sabbath for a second, or even like, like those mental breaks that we take throughout the day, uh, time to ref, refresh and pray. And how can we discern if or when calls to action or another person's request regarding racial justice is worth breaking Sabbath for? Do, how have you thought about that? Or even as a pastor, like, I got to show up Saturday to this thing or this thing is happening. Do I've, I've talked to a friend of mine who felt like really guilty turning this phone on Saturday night after Sabbath to all of this stuff that he was like completely not aware of because of Sabbath. He just felt a lot of guilt. Um, how do you just let that guilt? Like, what would you say? How, what would you say there? Like, how, Firstly, how, would, you, I mean, how would you discern I, it? Yeah. I mean, First of all, I recognize as a pastor, and you know it's a large congregation, and I recognize increasingly that um, uh, you know I'm I'm reaching people in different parts of this city, different parts of this country. I mean, I have to from the very gig, especially the pastors, recognize um, I'm not building this thing. I'm not holding this thing together. Yeah. I mean, my my personal pastoral life verse is Colossians one. Uh, where 17, where Paul says, uh, he is before all things and in him all things hold together. That's my pastoral life verse. Like, mm. I'm not holding this thing together. I'm not holding this church together. Jesus Christ is holding this church together. And so because he's holding it together, and sometimes it doesn't feel like he's holding it together, but because he's holding it together, I don't have to. And so I'm going to have what Henry Nouwen calls a ministry of absence that will now fill a ministry of presence. And what Nowen says in one of his journals is, uh, uh, is unless we learn how to leave, it's often the case that the spirit can't come. Now, yeah. I'm not talking about being irresponsible and being, uh, uh, you know, never present. We need both a ministry of presence and yeah. a ministry of absence. That's right. But for the sake of our own souls and longevity and perseverance, we are human beings. We can only go so far. You know what? Matt, Mark 6, I believe it's Mark 631. It could be off by 10 verses or so. I think it might be 6, <laughs> 631. I, this is what it essentially says. Jesus, there was so much work to be done and so many people coming at Jesus and his disciples that they had barely any time to eat. And so what did Jesus do? That's right. He said, let's get away and yeah. find a place of solitude to rest. Now, Jesus, don't you feel guilty about leaving those people? You know, so people yeah. do. And I think what Jesus recognized is very practically, if I don't step away, I cannot continue this mission. And I think that's the painful, I mean, when I read the gospels, I think, what about that next, Jesus healed a hundred people. What about 101? And I always yeah. grieve. I mean, because that could have been my child, 101. And now Jesus mm. is stepping away. The, the grief, the lament. And I have to hold at the same time, unless Jesus is stepping away with his disciples, there's no sustainability. And so, I mean, I look at Jesus. There's plenty of times Jesus had so much going and he still said, guys, we got to go. We got to get out yeah. of here. And so I like to think Jesus is my model. Um, now if a pastor is off six days a week and then working one, <laughs> yeah, totally. I mean, we got to talk about that, but if we're, if we're, if we're on six days and we're off one in this way, I think, um, I think, so I would tell the pastor, don't feel guilty. And how do you discern when to say, yes, I'm going to take the call when not? I, I, I think there are some situations where the urgency of a community, but if it's always urgent, and that's what we have to d discern and distinguish. If it's always urgent, it's probably not as urgent as yeah. we think it is. And uh, we would do well to step away. That's so good. I, yeah, I 100% I agree. And I think this is when we're teaching our, our churches uh, what sustainable like engagement in racial justice looks like. It has to be sustained with, yeah. the trellis of like Sabbath and uh, silence and time with God and community. It ha mm -hmm. That's the only way it's sustained. Yeah. Yeah. And, there, I, I mean, I've heard so many stories of activists who yeah. burn out and who are gifted, 
who have incredible communication ability, organizing ability, and within two, three, four, five years, they're burned out. And yeah. I'm thinking, wow. I mean, I think God had a 20 year, I wish God had, you recognize it was a 20 year run in you. Yeah. Uh, but if you stepped away, you could really extend this ministry of yours, but because we're going, 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 going. So, I mean, I think for the sake of the church, our world, we need to learn how to step away. Yeah. That's, yeah. Our, we have a race and belonging cohort and their mantra is, you know, racial uh, work in this in, in racial justice space is a marathon, not a sprint. Yep. And most people, you know, a lot of people right now are getting activated. They want to do something right now, like yep. immediately. And it's the people that, that work in the space all the time, like slow down, <laughs> take a break. And this is going to be the long, this is going to be maybe the rest of our lives. Yes. They look at yeah. it like that, you know? Yes. This morning, I thought, because a number of pastors are asking, you know, hey, Rich, what, what do you think the next step should be? And my advice to everyone is take the long view. And the image that comes to mind is the image that when Jesus is talking about an evil spirit in someone who's, that's been cast out. And he says, you know, he cleans the house, sweeps the house. But if you don't fill the house, yeah. you know, he's going to come with seven more spirits and the latter is going to be worse than the former. And I think <laughs> you, can, you can clean your house by denouncing racism for the next three weeks, every single day, Black Lives Matter, posting it. And then if a, if a congregation doesn't take the time to have the long view and say, how do we need to shift our values, our understanding of the gospel, our sermons, our level of community engagement? If we're not doing that, um, there are going to be some other spirits that, that are going to come because our house, house is not filled. Mm. And it's going to be worse later than it is right now. That's and right. I think it's a parallel metaphor. This is the long view, man. Yeah. So how do you hear and experience God through the work of racial justice? How have you heard and experienced God in this work yourself? And how has your church like experienced God through this work? Well, in terms of like the convergence of like this work of emotional health. And so again, emotional health is about love. Yeah. And um, when I think of emotional health, the language I often use is interior examination. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, the, the work of emotional health and justice held together, I think, are, are held through a commitment to self-examination, uh, a, a commitment to befriending feelings and the full mm -hmm. spectrum of feelings. And so that I could be a really an incarnational listening presence to others. Mm -hmm. And I think th that's that's how they converge. And so for me. When I'm in self-examination, uh, I'm a brown-skinned Puerto Rican New Yorker mm -hmm. um, who has black Puerto Rican family members, and I have recognized in my own self-examine, how has God come to me? I, by revealing to me all the ways that I still have to grow. Yeah. And so I've done lots of inventory in you know over the course of my following of christ especially the last few years how have i been socialized um, by my family of origin by, by the surrounding culture to see black people to see people who look like me to see asian people how have i been socialized and so in that self-examination i'm encountering god yeah. because i'm encountering truth and um, God dwells in truth. God does not dwell in illusion. God doesn't dwell in unreality. That's the only place God doesn't dwell. Mm -hmm. God, does, God dwells in reality and in truth. And so to the degree that I can be honest and live in reality with myself is the degree to which I will encounter God. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's one thing. In terms of befriending feelings, you know, to hold emotional health and matters of racial justice and reconciliation together, it requires us to befriend all of our feelings and, which, and give permission to people to be in their feelings as well. Hmm. And I think this is where it gets really dicey for people. And, and so I, I encounter God in that space of this is, this is the rage, the grief, the anxiety that I'm feeling. How do I befriend these things in a way where I now 
lifted up to God. Not, again, not for the sake of personal catharsis, yeah. but for the sake of communion with another person. Mm. And I think at the core of racial justice is our willingness to see another person made in the image of God, to enter into their space without trying to conform them, but to allow myself to be shaped by their own narrative and stories and fears and values and such. And so I think that, that's where the conversion is. I want to be a listening incarnational presence to understand whether it's rage, grief, anxiety. Um, and I, I think that's how they converge yeah. um, wow. that's, in those ways. That's so, that's, and that's so important. That's so good. No, so your New Life is a multicultural church. And so I would imagine you have people on all ends of the spectrum in this conversation. Mm-hmm. I think I've heard you talk about this publicly as well. Yeah. Um, and obviously this conversation is so loaded and comes with so much family of origin baggage. And like you just said, and it's so charged for people. So how do you keep people in the conversation on the right track, regardless of where they stand? Woo. I don't know if I can, but I'll tell you, (laughs) (laughs) well, new life has 75 nations represented in our church. Um, uh, you know, half of Queens is foreign born. So let me give you very quickly the four kinds of Christians at New Life Fellowship. Yeah, yeah. There is, number one, the conservative Christian um, who can only see good in this country. Yeah. Uh, you know, we are, we are blessed. We're the best country in the world. Why are you complaining? Yeah. Yeah. Then there's the, uh, and so I would say 25 to 30% of our church voted for Donald Trump in the 2016 election, just to give some context. You know, okay. probably yeah. 30% voted for Hillary Clinton. 20 for Bernie Sanders, 20% for Batman. They wrote somebody. <laughs> and so uh, that's like the political kind yeah. of makeup of our church. So there's that conservative person who, who sees nothing wrong with this country. Then there's the progressive uh, Christian in our congregation who can hardly see anything right with this country. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> then there is the immigrant Christian whose line of reasoning in these matters is, it was a lot worse in my country. Be grateful. So it's yeah. the grateful immigrant Christian. Yeah. And then there's the apolitical, let's just focus on the gospel Christian. Yeah. And so I imagine to some degree <laughs> or another, those four profiles fill many of our churches yep. to varying degrees. In our congregation, it is, a lot, so you've got 2,000 people who are in those four categories, give or take, all right? And so that's just me generalizing big time. Yeah, that's good, the good context. So that's my context. In addition to that, we have very, uh, you know, not just ethnic diversity, uh, there's um, economic diversity in our congregation as well. Uh, And so we have, you know, folks who are Yale and Harvard grads, uh, you know, hedge fund people, and then you have, folks who are who live two blocks down the road in a homeless shelter all gathering together and so how do i try to keep people engaged in this um i think the, the most important thing i've done as a leader and a pastor is to personally name the ways that i've been shaped hmm. and personally confess and be vulnerable yeah. And I can't imagine, I, I can't t- tell you how many times when I've said, this is how I have been socialized to see black people. And let's just stay right there for a second. How I've been, see- how I've been social, even though I've been, I'm, my mother is, uh, you know, black Puerto Rican, my grandfather black, I'm talking about as dark skin as you're going to get. And yeah. I've still been socialized because my proximity to blackness and black people means nothing. Uh, You can be proximate to black people and still be as racist as ever. And so I have recognized I have been socialized in a particular way. And if I can now name it and say every single day, I have to push back against the ways I've been socialized and the way my family of origin has regurgitated these particular messages about whether it's black people, Asian people across the board. If I can name that and confess that with regularity, it gives people the freedom to do it as well. And I I remember leading a seminar for some of our leaders and I did it and said, and I asked him, what's your messages that you have about black people? And he was so nervous about saying out loud what he's believed his entire life. And 
when I said, listen, I just did it, man. <laughs> I yeah, just yeah. Did it with <laughs> rawness. And when yeah. he began to say it, and I said, you know what? Now we can move a little closer to racial justice because yeah. the, whatever's in our soul, there's a straight line from what's in our soul to what often gets embodied in our systems. Yeah. And unless we're able to now name what's in our souls, then we can start reimagining what the world looks like publicly and socially and politically. But unless we're able to do that, honestly, so how am I able to hold our congregation together? I don't know if I'm holding this congregation together. I know people have left. Yeah. I know people think I'm, uh, some think I'm too political and uh, because I, I say things like black lives matter or, um, and so Dave, I, I don't know. I mean, I go on Facebook. Sometimes I'm encouraged. Sometimes I'm very discouraged. Yeah. Because I am not discouraged of what's happening in the world, discouraged of what's happening in the congregation I lead because I see their posts and I go, yeah. how can you be part of this church for 20 years yeah. and still be saying things like this? Yeah. Um, so uh, I don't want to romanticize this thing and, yeah. and, and idealize it. Uh, I think we've made great progress. I try to be vulnerable. And at the same time, there are times where I feel like Satan is just tearing our congregation apart. Yeah. And um, I think I try to live within those realities faithfully. Yeah. So my, my goal, my hope as a pastor is not to measure fruit, but to be faithful. And yeah. if I'm, if I just stay stuck at fruit, I'm going to give up at some point because it's not going to be the fruit that I want to see. And, but my, my job is to be faithful. Yeah. Rich, thank you so much. Um, I can keep talking to you like this forever. Um, I just want to say thank you for the way that you've led in this space, the way that you've um, encouraged our congregation, uh, helped me in this space a lot uh, over this last, uh, over a year. And I'm just really grateful for you. Thank you for saying yes to, and this has been really, really, really rich. I mean, so rich. I mean, no, maybe pun. But yeah. I didn't realize until after I said it. <laughs> so it wasn't really a pun, but seriously, it's been, it's been really good. So well, bless you. Love the bless work you're doing, bro. Love the work you're doing. Um, you are in, I think, an important part of our country that can bear witness to Christ in some significant ways. And so keep it up. Thanks, man. All right, peace.